So Niall Dennehy is our next speaker. He is co-founder and COO of AidTech, whose mission is huge, whose mission is to bring social and financial inclusion to the world's undocumented and underserved populations using digital identity-based blockchain technology. So frankly, I'm just really relieved that I can understand now potentially at the end of this an application of blockchain. So woohoo for Niall, thank you. Is this on? It should be. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing? Delighted to be here. Uh, Joan did steal my intro. The, so the mission of ATEC is to bring social and financial inclusion to the undocumented and the underserved. We do it with a piece of technology called blockchain. If you look very carefully at the image behind me there, there's a reason that's there. It's connecting up the dots. I'll speak a little bit about that later on. But the way we see it today in the world, and I, I feel like I'm, this is a TED talk, I won't get too pretentious now for the moment. I might get a little bit more pretentious later on when I tell you about the awards that we've won. Um, but the reason I'm showing you the globe there and the connected dots is because we believe nowadays you've got these exponential technologies, blockchain being one of them, that can basically enable anybody anywhere in the world who has access to a computer, to a laptop, to make a massive impact and that's why we set out to make the impact. We thought the technology does exist today. We took inspiration from quite a few people along the way. And if I've got my slides right now, the next one, I'll get the clicker. I'll tell you two of the people who gave me a little bit of inspiration, um, probably not on a global level, but I'm originally from uh, Cork. Uh, all the wannabe Corkonians in the room, all the Corkonians. Can you get a shout? Um, but it all started out for me here, uh, I didn't even know it at the time, a place called Castle Island Motor Factors. So my two parents, they to this day, they run a business called Castle Island Motor Factors down in Kerry. And what they do is they sell car parts to people like mechanics, people in garages. And has anybody ever tried to sell car parts to a mechanic? That's yeah, a pretty tough thing to do. It's a pretty tough thing to do, but if you can do that, you can pretty much sell anything. But that's where it all started out. So by the age of 11, I was working behind the counter, dealing with farmers, dealing with mechanics, trying to sell them car parts. So again, I just wanted to shout out to my parents up there. The woman on the right is Nora. The guy on the left is Dano. The guy with the Kerry jersey, we won't talk about him. The guy with the Galway jersey is not even from Galway, but that was a cycle they were doing. But that's where it all started out, at a pretty small level. And then, as we went along, I, I want to tell you why ATEC, we started at first, but to go back to the mission of the company and to expand on it a little bit more, Another business that I did start, and I think if you do start a business nowadays, or anybody who does start a business, going back to the point that was mentioned earlier on, you've got to have a reason really to do it. Anybody know that guy Simon Sinek? He gives a great talk about why you do something, and uh, you know, DC talked about getting up in the morning, the perseverance that, that you've got to have to get out of bed before anybody else to stay up later. But we started a business, myself and my co-founder Joe, called Imprez, and to give you a bit of background on that, what it was was a presentation, training, and design business using a piece of software that you might be familiar with called Prezi. And we thought, look, we had backgrounds as technical trainers. We worked for a telco company called Ericsson. We went around the world. Um, I went to 33 countries in the space of about three years, including places like Africa. And I thought, you know what, I have to set up a business for myself, and I want to do it for three reasons. Number one, I wanted to make money. And to be honest with you, that was probably the main driving factor for that one. Number two, I didn't want to work for anybody else. And number three then, I wanted to have some fun doing it. They were the three drivers for that company. And it didn't really work out because we were missing one key driver. And that was really why we're doing it. And the why for us was, how can we make an impact? And that's really how ATEC came about. And it all really happened by accident. I'll tell you the story now in a couple of moments. But somebody who did give us a lot of inspiration was a guy called Peter Diamandis. And Peter Diamandis was the co-founder of the X Prize. And the X Prize is a really, really big, ambitious, bold vision. And he was basically, he's trying to mine asteroids now in outer space because Peter will tell you, and I've met him before, that there's about $4.4 trillion worth of iron ore on an asteroid. So he's working on bringing asteroids back to Earth right now. And that's how big, and I don't want to curse on stage, but that's how big their effing vision is. It's absolutely huge. And we kind of thought about that when we heard him saying, look, if you're not doing something every day, if you're not trying to make a difference to society and to make an impact, then you're doing humanity a disservice. I know it's an easy thing to say, but going back to the first image there with the connected dots, with something like blockchain, with AI, you know, it's a real buzzword at the moment, you can genuinely make an impact. And I'll show you how we are making an impact right now. 
but we did take a lot of uh, inspiration from Peter. And going back to the four reasons why we created ATEC, number one was to make the impact. Number two was to do something fun. Number three was so that we didn't have to work for anybody else. They were the key things um, when it came to the company. But it all did really happen by accident. And what happened uh, was back in 2009, my co-founder, a guy called Joe Thompson, who's based in Dublin here, I call him Quadzilla because he's got an absolutely massive pair of quads that you might see up there. But he ran a marathon called the Marathon de Sabla in 2009 through the Moroccan desert. And Joe raised a big sum of money. He raised $122,000. And he wasn't able to trace where the money went to. So it was at the height of the recession back in 2009. One guy in Dublin gave him 5,000 euro. And he rang Joe up about six months later and said, Joe, can you tell me where that money went? And Joe wasn't able to give him an answer. So he rang up the charity. They rang somebody down in Tanzania. And they said, we think your money went to somebody in Tanzania. And the money that he raised originally was meant to go to children suffering from facial disfiguration in sub-Saharan Africa. But long story short, we weren't able to trace that. And again, it's not that we were humanitarians by default. That happened in 2009. And at the same time that was happening, and going back to the idea of exponential technologies, blockchain, Bitcoin, actually happened around the same time. So at the height of the recession and the midst of the financial crisis back in 2009, this anonymous person, or persons, we can't really say, called Satoshi Nakamoto, created this white paper about something called Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, as you all, all, you all know, is a storage of value. But if you think about what's happened with the internet, the internet has democratized a huge amount of things. I'm getting a little bit more TED talking now again here, so bear with me. But if you think about it from four points of view, if you think about uh, the movement of text, if I wanted to send a letter from Ireland all the way to Australia, which was effectively text, maybe 20, 30 years ago, how would I do that? You know, I'd have to you know, maybe get a letter, send it up by ship or plane or whatever, telegram before that. But with the internet now, with my mobile phone here, I can effectively send a message to somebody in Australia. It's there within a fraction of a second with WhatsApp, which I get for free, even though I am the, pay I am the product in that case. If you think about the movement of voice, if I want to make a telephone call now with the internet, things like Skype, once I've got a basic internet connection, I can actually make a call with anybody anywhere in the world. And if you think about the video, so beforehand, if I wanted to get out there to, to let people know who I am, I would have to go through somebody like RTE or BBC to make it happen. But with the internet nowadays, you can go on YouTube, you can create your own channel, you can reach millions of people, billions of views. But going back to what ATEC and what we do is the fourth one that we haven't really cracked as of yet is the movement of value. So the storage and the movement of value. But that did change back in 2009. And if you think about Bitcoin, this decentralized currency that enables people to send something of value to each other without any middleman, without any banks, without any restrictions, it means that a whole host of opportunities opened up and a plethora of opportunities, which is why, again, I would say to you guys, if you're going to start something today, start something really big. Like the business I started before, Imprez, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't done for the right reasons. It was done to make money, as I mentioned, you know, not work for somebody else. Pretty admirable, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think nowadays, if you can start a business, and if you can make an impact, and if you can make money at the same time, then do it. But going back to what blockchain is, blockchain will enable you to send something of value without a middleman, without a bank, without anybody getting in the way, and that opens up an absolutely huge amount of opportunities. But back to Joe. Joe then, um, he started doing a master's in cryptocurrency through the University of Nicosia in Cyprus around the year 2012. And at the same time, when he was doing his thesis, there was somebody in Dublin who runs a charity called Bike to Belarus, a guy called Joe McGrath. And Joe McGrath was helping uh, Joe with the thesis. And he said, you know, Joe, this thing here that you have, this, uh, this blockchain, this Bitcoin, the real innovation here is transparency. And again, based on that, he, your man said, look, I have a charity. If you were to harness this technology to show where the money goes, then that would be something that's really, really, that would be huge for us. So going back to the desert, to Morocco, Joe thought about that and said, look, if I got a donation from somebody else, if I harnessed this technology in a really unique way, would there be a way for us to show people where their money goes? And that's really what ATEC is all about right now. And again, we're making that impact. Um, what I didn't tell you there about Joe, and this goes back to the personification of perseverance, of inspiration, of determination. It sounded like a rapper now. I'm floating like a butterfly. I'm stinging like a bee. My name is Niley D. But Joe, he collapsed on day two. 
He collapsed again on day three. He got back up. He was just about to be attached to a drip. And they told Joe that if you get attached to the drip right now, your race is run. He continued on, 78 kilometers on day four. The yardstick was you had to stay ahead of a camel, and Joe just about did that. And since from day one with ATEC, it's been a slog, because what we're trying to do is so big, and we had to move beyond Ireland to do it, realistically, to places like Silicon Valley, to London, where people appreciated the vision that we had a little bit more, to be honest with you. I'll talk about that shortly. But he stayed ahead of the camel that day, and we've had this camel chasing us from day one, really, with ATEC, because it's such a big vision. And to persuade people that it's a worthwhile vision has been something we've worked hard at. And I'll show you then how we address that with the wins that we have. But the big, big problem is out there today, $4.4 trillion is lost or stolen because of fraud, corruption, and a lack of transparency. And it's something really that no government, no NGO, or no AG agency has been able to solve. But this is the problem that we are setting about solving. And what, if anybody um, in the audience, what was the number that I mentioned with Peter Diamandis, you know, the, uh, the iron ore? It's the same thing, it's a huge problem, but also a huge opportunity. And the way we think we can do it, and the way we are doing it today, is by leveraging blockchain. And with blockchain, what we can do is we can distribute digital entitlements completely transparently to a, a person's digital identity. And to give you a bit of context, right now around the world, there are 2.4 billion people around the world without a legal identity. And one of the goals of the United Nations, um, anybody heard of the Sustainable Development Goals? And again, I'm talking about all these big things because it's the vision that we have, we want to solve them. But the UN have, uh, they've set 17 targets that they want to achieve by the year 2030. And uh, one of them is target 16.9, and it's to bring legal identity to everybody in the world by the year 2030. So when we set out in day one, we thought, okay, how can we, how can we you know, make a difference in something that's really, really big? How can we make that, that impact? And if you look at the base of people then that we're targeting with the company, we are for profit, as I keep mentioning, we effectively, as it stands today, have a user base of about 2.4 billion people to start off with. But the key thing for us uh, is to have the partners that would enable you to get there. So anybody read a book uh, or hear of a guy called Steve Case? He was the founder of AOL. So Steve Case believes now that we're living the third wave, and he calls it the third wave of startups. The first wave was creating companies like Cisco, uh, you know, Juniper, etc. They enabled us to move information around the internet. The second wave of companies were people like Facebook, you've got Google, who are making sense of all the data. And the third wave of companies now out there in the field today are doing stuff in the real world. So people like Airbnb, Uber with cars, health, medicine. So that's what we're really trying to do, but you need a lot of patience to make it happen. You need the right partners to make it happen. And that's what I'm gonna come on to next. So any business nowadays, if you're trying to make an impact, you can start it off with yourself, but we believe, and it's working for us today, is that you've got to establish partnerships with people who can bring you the scale and who can give you the reach that we do and that you need. So we work with a lot of governments, we work with a lot of NGOs, we work with a lot of charities. So for example, one of the people that we work with is the United Nations Development Program. And the analogy that I would have there is we're like a little David, but they take us around the world. We meet with governments. We're like almost like David piggybacking in the back of Goliath. And because we've got their reputation behind us, it's like we're throwing a stone into the eye of this big dragon who is the gatekeeper. So it's getting beyond the gatekeeper. You need um, to do that. That's the target that I mentioned, 16.9, to bring legal identity to everybody in the world. And again, it all boils back to why. Why do we think we're capable of doing it? Well, again, to talk about Joe, I keep bringing it back to him. Um, only recently he was named by the United Nations as uh, the Sustainable Development Goals Pioneer for Blockchain Technology. And if you look at him up there very carefully, that is, believe it or not, Times Square in New York, up in a billboard, and he's next to the image of the CEO of Total, a big French multinational oil company. Um, so again, for us, establishing credibility from day one is something that we've been focused on because as a small little Irish startup, to try and reach the numbers that you need to reach to meet the people that you want, you've got to... Um, You've got to basically partner with the right people. And to go back then to the mission of the company, here is Gabriel from the Red Cross. He's issuing digital identities on our platform. And what we did with our technology to prove it worked was on one of the hardest places in the world, we issued digital identities to Syrian refugees from a refugee camp, and we enabled them to get goods and products from a supermarket in a completely transparent manner using blockchain technology. So we wanted to prove, number one, could we do this? So what we did was we partnered, and this goes back to the idea of partnerships, 
uh, partner with the big boys. We went to the Red Cross. We told them we had this exponential technology. It can make a difference. We'll start out small. We'll do a pilot project. We'll get on the ground. And the funding for that project actually came from the same guy who gave Joe a big donation and a lot more. But we wanted to prove that we could have this technology. And another example then would be donations. So if you want to make a donation to an individual, one of the people then that you could make a donation to would be somebody like uh, one of the ladies who appeared in the previous video there. But if you make a donation to somebody with our technology, scan it then at the point of sale, up will pop information about who you are, what you're entitled to. That could be rice. You enter the amount of rice that you wish to purchase, and then a permanent record is stored on this technology that I keep coming back to, the blockchain, which enables anybody anywhere in the world to see that uh, transaction ap actually happening. So I keep going back to it. Try and start out with a really, really big problem. Try and see how you can focus in on the small parts that you can make a difference. Maybe take little baby steps at the very start. Keep building up the credibility, uh, your traction, etc. And that's what you get with our technology at the end. You can see where your money was spent, by whom, for what, how much. And complete end-to-end -end traceability. And again, it all boils down to the team. So again, you'll hear people talk about why the team is important. So without ATEC, without the team that we have, and finding that right dynamic, so early on establishing who you can work with, who are the right people that um, you get along with. You know, again, it is a slog, and you're going to get in the trenches. You're going to get bullets coming at you every day. You're going to be tired in the morning, tired in the evening, keep going on. I was up until 4 a.m. last night uh, on a call with the, the National Philanthropy Society of uh, Singapore. But the reason I can do that is because we have a really solid team. Uh, we pretty much we knew each other from day one. We brought in the right people. So having the right team is key to it. And going back to the partners, some of the people that we work with today would be the International Federation of the Red Cross, the United Nations Development Program, St. Vincent de Paul here in Dublin. Last night, we just got a grant uh, of $200,000 from the Rockefeller Foundation in New York. The reason we got that was down to pure hustle. We sold them on the vision, told them what we have, told them we will make an impact. Give us your money. A little bit aggressive, not arrogant, but prove to them, because of the traction that we have, that we can deliver for you. And again, we're really on a journey now, and it's only beginning. We also got money from the government of Dubai. We're doing a project in Jordan to roll out welfare to 10,000 people in the Middle East starting next year. So again, um, prove that you can do it. Get the partners who enable you to scale for us. It's like P people like PwC. So you might think I'm throwing all these big names at you, but it really is for a purpose. And it, it is from day one. Try and establish partnerships with people who can help you get to where you need to get, with at the same time not forgetting who you are, where you've come from. A little bit more about us in ATEC. We're IBM's number one global startup in 2017. And the reason I'm putting up this here is to show you that we really, to be honest with you, we had to look beyond Ireland from day one because the vision that we had was a little bit too big. We were using a technology that people thought was used for buying weapons and drugs. But we went to Silicon Valley. One guy up there who invested in us, he saw the potential, Jason Calacanis. He's got seven companies in his portfolio who are worth over a billion. But we find we get more, it's a much easier sell in places like Silicon Valley than it would be in Dublin and even in London because we've got such a big vision. That's where we had to go. And only recently, too, we were announced as the City Tech for Integrity Global Game Changer Award using technology to fight corruption. That's Christine Lagarde up there from the IMF. She gave us an award through um, MasterCard. And the reason I'm putting it up there, and it's not to slate my own native country, but on the very same day that we uh, pitched for this event in Dublin, we actually we won, but on the very same day then, I pitched at another event uh, here in Dublin with the exact same script, and we didn't even come in the top 10. And again, I think the vision that we had was a little bit too big. So I'm not dismissing where we are here, but if you want the global business, sometimes you do have to look beyond Ireland, not to end on a negative note. But that is really, um, that's ATEC. That's what we're doing. Big vision. We're solving it right now. Um, so from day one, if you want to make a big impact, think about a big vision, why you're going to do it, would be my, um, my, my thoughts. So thank you for your time.